Our next uh, speaker is uh, going to be uh, Ziv uh, Katsir, who is now a PhD student in our department. But a few years ago, Ziv served as uh, the CTO of Varian Systems Cyber Intelligence uh, Division. Ziv, please. So, I'm Ziv, hey, and I'm going to talk about the armadillo problem, which is uh, a nice way to say I'm going to talk about adversarial learning um, and how it kind of wrecks all attempts to do proper AI. Cool. Um, so this is the old me. I used this slide a large number of times up until a year ago. So, like Mark said, I spent most of the, my adult life in the industry, with the last part being uh, the CTO of Varian Systems. Um, and now I'm a PhD student here in Ben Gurion, and if all goes well, within two years from now, approximately, I'm going to be a certified gradient trainer. Okay, no one is laughing, meaning no one is doing deep learning. <laughs> Guys, gradient trainer, come on, bluff. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, if you, okay, so how many of you saw this picture before? Great, so like, some like 20%. So if you saw this picture before, you know something about adversarial learning. And the trick is, you take a panda or an input, you mix it with some noise, which looks like a random noise, but in fact it's not. And you get another panda, which kind of looks the same like the film panda, but um, this panda here was perfectly classified by a neural network, and the other one over there, is classified as a given. Look, with 99.3% of certainty. Um, and I personally can hardly tell the two pandas apart. So that's in a nutshell adversarial learning. Okay? And most of the um, examples we use are from the image domain, simply because it's easy, it's easy to, to um, kind of um, use. What? To label? Yeah, there are many, many labeled data sets, many, many available images, and it's easy to demonstrate this way. Uh, but I personally like this one. Okay, so this is an armadillo, right? Who here in the audience doesn't see the armadillo? Okay, not only this is an armadillo, this is a 99.9 something percent of an armadillo, okay? <laughs> and that's the main point. The reason I like this one and not this one, is because it tells us something deeper about neural networks. The way to do this and, and the previous one is actually the same, okay? But here we started with a black, blank image and not with a something like... We didn't start with a panda, we started with a black image, okay? And what this tells me is that actually deep neural networks do not understand a thing. And that's kind of sad, right? When we learned deep neural networks, they told us that they kind of create a deep understanding or everything. They create abstract concepts and everything. But in fact, the way I see it, deep neural networks are just new and fancy ways to creating approximations. They are not that much different from the random forests or the other boost or the SVMs we used in the past. Okay, so uh, around 2014 came the panda and everybody were devastated, right? We thought we've got this terrific tool to do uh, um, decision-making and classification and whatever. Um, at 2014, deep neural networks are starting to identify faces and people better than the human. So, and, and then at the same time comes the panda. Uh, the immediate response from the uh, machine learning community is to say, okay, this is wrong. This is a minor mistake and we're going to fix it in a minute. This minute is taking five years and today after five years, nobody thinks it's going to be fixed anymore. Everybody just accept that this is the case. And finally, after going through all five uh, phases of mourning, uh, through denial and anger and bargaining, finally, we're starting to discuss the reasons, the deep reasons behind it. Okay, why is this actually taking place? And hopefully, um, through 2020, we, we're going to start seeing some kind of acceptance. Hopefully. Uh, okay, so what people are currently doing within this domain? And please forgive me, this is a huge domain in 15 minutes, so we're going to do just, you know, a taste. 
Many people are still developing new attacks and new defense mechanisms and applying the existing defense or attacks mechanisms to new domains. So from image, let's move to text, to audio. Within image, let's do uh, um, autonomous cars, let's do uh, uh, disease identification through MRI, uh, X-ray, etc., etc. Uh, we can do audio, we can do stack, uh, uh, stock uh, prediction and try trick stock predictions and insurance and so on and so forth. New attacks, new domains, and new content, uh, uh, new attacks, new defenses, and new content domains. Second thing, and this is to me where it starts being interesting, is trying to identify the boundaries, the barriers of uh, adversarial learning. So, how extensive is this? Okay, how deep is the problem? Where does it end? And finally, uh, and this is what I'm trying to do personally, is try to understand what drives this. Thing. What makes it happen in the first place? What are the really profound, deep principles that allow adversarial learning to exist? Um, before we kind of explain, you know, some of the newest parts, let's understand how the basic parts are working. Okay? So under the hood, what we do, what we do is we take um, basically the same panda. Uh, so our panda is X over here, and we are looking for some kind of a perturbation delta. So that together, when we apply the neural network, F over here, we're going to get a different classification other than C. So C is our correct classification. Here it is. We've got a classifier. We've got a valid input. We've got the true class. And we are looking for some perturbation. Nobody else other than the domain of adversarial learning knows the word perturbation. Never mind. Okay, but we are looking for some perturbation so that eventually, F will produce something different than C. And while doing so, we also want delta to be small. We want it to be small so that people cannot detect it. That's a trick. The only problem is that solving this pair of equations is kind of complex. It's hard to do. So still, in order to give everybody else who didn't get this kind of lecture before an intuition, here is a neural network, right? Let's see how we train it. We start with random weights, right? We put in some kind of a known uh, uh, input, labeled input, and we initially get random results. But we uh, compute the gradient with respect to the loss, and gradually, slowly, slowly, we correct the weights over the connection between the neurons until uh, loss is minimized, and eventually we get the, the right classification, right? Okay, how many people of you knew about this process in before? Okay, good. It's much better. Uh, what we do with adversarial learning is that instead of training the weights, we are training the input. Okay, the network is not mine. I'm attacking it. I cannot change it anymore, so I cannot change the weights. But I, what I can do, I can change the input. So I'm taking the same loss gradient, and I'm projecting it towards the input. Essentially, I'm using the same backpropagation trick that allows us to train networks in the first place. Cool. So this is nice, and uh, we, um, you know, we know how to attack networks, and we know how to find adversarial examples. And then many people came and said, okay, guys, but my network is mine. I keep it secret. And if it's secret, nobody can calculate the loss. If you cannot calculate the loss, you cannot get the gradient. And with no gradient, you've got no adversarial example, and I'm safe. Right? So then uh, comes uh, Batista and then Pepperknot and say, <laughs> But I can attack your network even if I don't know it in, in, anyway. I don't have your network and I don't have your data set. So wh what I'm going to do, I'm going to train my own network. I'm going to take some data from a public source and I'm going to take some model from a state-of-the-art paper that was published last year, something like that. And I'm going to train my, no my own model. And now I've got a white box scenario. I'm going to attack my own model, take the resulting adversarial examples and feed them to the target model. And ta-da! 70% of cases, I'm going to trick the target model as well. This is a ta-da moment, okay, guys? I'm taking it, <laughs> yeah, this is the, and this is the time for everybody in the audience to hold hands and start crying. That's the right point in time. Because I'm attacking a black box defenses. So I'm attacking a neural network that I, I never saw before. I don't know anything about its internals and still able to attack it. That's devastating. And because of this, uh, this entire domain of adversarial learning became interesting in the first place. Cool. 
Uh, what can we do? Okay, what can we do? I told you that uh, around this time of uh, like this year and hopefully going to the next year, we, we started seeing some deep insights about uh, deep neural networks. So here it is. Uh, one of my favorite, Professor Adi Shamirs, which you all know for the RSA, right? The S in RSA, uh, published this year a paper that kind of proves the existence of adversarial examples. In a way, he says, stop trying to uh, ignore them. They're here to stay. Um, yes, there are some tweaks. It's not in all cases, etc. But he's going there. Um, <clears throat> This work, which I really like, talks about how uh, susceptibility to adversarial examples increases together with the input space. Okay? And they prove that as the input space becomes larger, the network itself becomes considerably less resilient to attacks. Finally, and this is a great line of works, there are three or four of those, that show that you can get meaningful classification with random weights as well. So this kind of makes us think, you know, what is it within the network that actually classifies things? Hmm. Okay, so um, two words about my work, and this is going to be presented in about two weeks from now in Budapest. Um, if everything is simply gradients, and if the network doesn't really understand anything, if you want to protect it, you need to be the ball. This is taken from ant Z. This is a demolition ball from, uh, made of ants, and the ants are trying to kind of break a hole into the, um, into the ground. And so if I want to defend against adversarial examples, I have to think like an adversarial example, right? So an adversarial example is designed to do actually two things. First, it's designed to look like a valid input, and second, it's designed to, mis to cause misclassification, right? Okay, so when I'm saying be the ball, remember those two things. It looks valid and it causes misclassification. Um, okay, this is a little bit frightening, but I'm going to guide you through. Uh, I took a simple VGG16 network and I classified the very well known CIFAR 10 dataset. Okay, and top left, we got the kind of input scenario points of different colors all meshed up into one another, right? And then we process it with four layers, eight layers, and going on and so forth. And this is a kind of a, this is a TSNE plot, for those of you who know it. It allows a two-dimensional plot of high-dimensional things. Uh, the actual location within the plot means nothing, but the um, relative position of, of objects is meaningful. So if I see here that the blue is separated from the red, they're well separated within the high dimension as well. Cool. So what we see is that as we go through the network, right, separation lines become clearer. And that's what we would expect from a deep neural network. But the point is, now think of each and every one of those um, uh, plots as a hyperspace, right? I can think of a red dot starting over here, as it moves through the diagrams, it's going to go together with the, its friend red dots. All red dots are going to move together through those hyperspaces, right? But the thing is that adversarial examples are not going to do that. If I got an adversarial example that was constructed out of a red dot, and it's expected to look eventually like a green dot or a blue dot, so initially it's going to be close to the red dot, say, over here, but eventually, it's going to stay within the green zone over here, right? And this is exactly what we are trying to detect with our detector. Another hard to understand graph, but bear with me. Okay. This thing here, the probability of moving from one color zone to another color zone throughout the uh, processing of the network. And obviously, the blue line here represents normal input. So obviously, normal points stop moving that much within one color zone to another, while at the cell examples, they move quite kind of sporadically from one zone to another. And we actually leverage this difference in probability of moving from one zone to another to create a, a detector that is able to say, okay, whether this input is a valid input or not. Uh, <clears throat> right? This is here translated to a log likelihood, 
again, we see a very nice separation of the lines, which allows us to do a, a, a detector. And we reach 95% accuracy and differentiation over the Carlin and Wagner attack, which is unprecedented and, yeah, very great. Uh, <laughs> OK. Um, going back to the take home message, guys, deep neural networks, they don't learn anything. Sorry to burst the bubble. Um, it's all in the gradients. Um, and those gradients hide a whole lot of armadillos. So if we want to find those armadillos, and if we want to eventually block, block those armadillos, we need to go deep. We need to think of the very fundamental things that happen at the single neuron level or the layer level. That's it. One last note. <laughs> uh, the only reason why those slides look not looks so nice is Yael Matov, and I need to say much thanks to her. Um, my personal slides, they look awful. Trust me. So if you want to reach me, this is how, and thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for uh, more questions. Thank you. So let's uh, thank the speaker again.